You're watching Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Revi, and joining us from New York City is Professor Sherry Berman. She's with the Bernard College, the Political Science Department there, professor at Columbia University. Professor Sherry Berman, first of all, congratulations for your latest book, Democracy and Dictatorship in Europe, and thank you so much for giving us some time. It's my pleasure. Just uh, starting out on your book, which is, is so sweeping because it's looking at uh, history over 200 years in Europe and uh, the development of democracies. But you also very interestingly point out uh, why there is a growing wave of illiberalism in the world. And, and that's something that's worrying a lot of people across the globe. A little bit on your thoughts on the latter. Well, I think that a lot of times people confuse democracy, which is basically free and fair elections, the ability of people to choose their leaders and governments with liberalism, which is something actually quite different and historically has often been in tension with democracy. Liberalism is about accepting individual rights and minority rights. It's about accepting limits on government. It's about accepting all kinds of civil liberties that um, actually for a lot of people are much more difficult to accept. It touches on questions of identity. It touches on questions of political equality. And I think most people throughout time have understood the rationale behind majority rule and democracy, but accepting all of the things that go with liberalism has been a much harder sell historically. Um, and so from a historical perspective, knowing the way things developed in Europe, it's not surprising to me that particularly in new democracies, getting consensus around liberal values has proven to be very, very difficult indeed. But it's not just the case in Europe. I mean, we're seeing it in the, in the U.S., for example, which you've dealt with in a re recent article. We're seeing it, accusations in India as well, in Brazil. There are so many countries around the world. Uh, what's the reason for that? Well, questions about, again, national identity, about who should be a member of the national community. These are very difficult questions for individuals and societies to deal with. And so that throughout time, these questions reemerge, again, is both historically with precedent and also, again, not surprising because all kinds of things can bring back questions about national identity, whether it's periods of economic stress, whether it's external threats from another enemy, whether it's new demographic realities in a country, all of these things raise issues around, again, liberal values and national identities. And so that we're going through a period throughout the world today when so much is changing and therefore when people are kind of falling back into um, tribal identities, subnational identities, questions about what their nation really is, this is not um, particularly surprising, even if it is quite um, uh, disturbing in many ways. Uh, Professor Berman, now when you you deal with democracies and their development and, and uh, dictatorships and we're looking at them, it, it's uh, political scientists, like you pointed out, use two terms, which is uh, systemic legitimacy and performance legitimacy. And uh, you try to explain that in terms of the development of these two systems or the fall of uh, those systems, right? Correct. I mean, performance legitimacy is now the kind of legitimacy that most dictatorships have. That is to say, they justify their existence on the basis of promises to produce better economic outcomes, protection against external enemies or sometimes internal enemies, things like that. Systemic legitimacy comes from um, people believing in the value or the superiority of the system itself. And that's what democracy is supposed to have, right? You're not supposed to choose democracy because you like what policies your government produces or you're in favor of a particular leader. You're supposed to have faith in democracy because it's the system that enables people, again, to have a right to have a voice in their country's future. And that sort of systemic legitimacy should give democracies greater stability. So if you don't like your government, if you don't like its policies, then you have the option of changing that government and those leaders, right? And so systemic legitimacy should give democracy the ability to weather challenges in a way that dictatorships cannot do without resort to force. Without resort to force, and it's interesting, if you bring it to a, a contextual uh, uh, position in Europe itself, when you look at, say, what's happening in Belarus, now, Alexander, uh, uh, the, the president there was, uh, I think he was elected in 1995, and that was probably the only free and fair elections. And since yeah. then, it's been an authoritarian regime. Oh, yeah. What's happening there? How would you explain, in terms of theory and practice, how would you join them, say, in a specific example like Belarus? 
right? So Lukashenko is facing unprecedented protests in his country, right? Uh, and triggered by what was obviously, as you kind of noted, another not free and fair election. He's not produced much performance for his country. His country is poor, impoverished, and isolated. And the only way, therefore, he can remain in power is by force. He has to use the military. He has to use other oppressive forces. And, you know, after a while, um, when people sense some kind of weakness or the challenges have just gotten too great, they rise up. And I should point out, as I'm sure you and your viewers are well aware, that this is just part of a wave of protests that has been sweeping across the globe against weak democracies, corrupt democracies like those that exist in Lebanon, dictatorships like those in Belarus and Thailand. And, you know, people see that, you know, this is a time when people all over the world are suffering and rising up. And there is a kind of wave effect that comes from that. Belarus now has to, Lukashenko now has to rely on both his military and the support of Russia. Otherwise, he has no way of staying in power. He has no legitimacy. He has produced nothing for his country but further suffering. Well, when you look at uh, the Soviet Union and what happened there, well, one of the reasons was, as you pointed out, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and Perestroika and Glasnost, and he, he let go of that use of force. And uh, then, of course, the economic uh, issues came in and the whole Soviet Union collapsed. China is a very different example. Uh, isn't that correct? Because they have been performing. That, that performance index has been very high over decades. That's correct. I mean, the Chinese example is really interesting and obviously incredibly important. What, chi what the Chinese dictatorship has managed to do is basically give its people a bargain, right? We will produce ever greater economic performance, ever greater wealth, um, more material success for this country, more external power for this country. And in return for that, you give up your personal liberties and your right to have a say in how the country's future is going to look. Now, given how successfully that regime has performed, that bargain has obviously been worthwhile for a lot of people, but it is a very fragile bargain. And we can see that, for instance, in the way that the regime responded to the pandemic. Everybody knows that that initial response was a disaster, and it was a disaster that flowed precisely from the weaknesses of dictatorship, a desire to cover up, an unwillingness on the part of local officials to give higher level officials bad news. All of those things made the pandemic much worse and enabled it to spread across the globe. And the regime, because it is so dependent on showing its citizens that its performance is superior, had no choice but to A, cover that up, and then B, mount a giant propaganda effort afterwards to kind of try to convince its citizens that it was doing a better job than other countries. Um, you know, and it has to do that because if it does not convince its citizens that its performance is exemplary, then the only thing it can do is force and repression. And that can be very successful, but it is very, very costly, especially over the long term. And uh, dangerous. And, and one of the tools, as you pointed out there, in a situation like that, when force has to be used, when the performance indices are not up to expectations or in, in China's case, to uh, what they've been doing in the past, is by using the nationalism card. And we've seen what's happened, whether it's in the East China Sea, South China Sea, on the northern border with uh, India as well in Ladakh. Now, that's also a dangerous game that uh, is being played, right? Right. Again, and historically, and the European cases here are sort of great examples of that. Um, you know, that is another way that a dictatorship will try to gain legitimacy by trying to convince its citizens that it faces external or sometimes internal threats. It will whip up nationalism to get them to accept the government and, again, be willing to give up their personal liberties. But that is very dangerous. We can see that even in a case with a country as powerful as China. I mean, conflicts with um, countries, particularly in its region, um, are on the horizon. Countries in Asia are very, very worried about rising Chinese power. Obviously, conflicts with the United States have grown, although that is not entirely China's fault, of course. Um, and, you know, this really heightens, you know, it heightens the costs for the regime because it can keep pressing on nationalism, but it really endangers the regime. It makes the regime more likely to come into conflicts, which could have terrible consequences, not just for it, but for its society and its citizens more generally. Professor Bourbon, uh, the, the cards of nationalism are also used by democracies when they are not performing. So uh, where, where do you draw that line in distinguishing? So absolutely. I mean, it is a very, very powerful way to distract citizens from other kinds of problems, economic problems, 
social problems, but it is really very dangerous for all societies because what it does is it heightens both internal and external conflicts. And, you know, democracies have the ability to vote out a leader and therefore to change course. But even with that, the damage can be very, very long lasting. I mean, once you kind of plant the seeds of internal division or resentment against certain kinds of foreigners, those are very difficult genies to put back in the bottle. Um, But they can, unfortunately, be very effective in whipping up people's, um, you know, fears and resentments. So o- overall, in a nutshell, would you say that authoritarian, uh, authoritarian uh, regimes or governments or dictatorships which are not being able to perform economically to the satisfaction of uh, their people are threatened, even a country as big as uh, China, I mean the regime itself? Well, they always have this dilemma, right? Without systemic legitimacy, right? Whether it's The Chinese regime, or you mentioned before the former Soviet Union, once people stopped believing in communism, they always have to be on their guard because without the performance, the only thing they have recourse to is force and or nationalism. Now, again, we all know that you can repress your citizens for a very long time, but that is a very, very delicate balance. All kinds of things can throw it off, right? A defeat in war a decision on the part of the military that it's just not worth it anymore with hundreds of thousands of people out on the street. They just don't want to kill that many of their fellow citizens. Um, And so it does keep the regime constantly forced into this balancing act that democracies in theory should not have to do because if the government is not doing a good job in a democracy, citizens have the ability to change course. Again, as long as those elections remain, as long as the other things that enable citizens to express their discontent and have their voices heard remain in place. Professor Sherryburn Berman, absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your insight. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And just a reminder to our viewers, you can just log on to our website, Strat News Global, to get all the latest news and analysis from an Indian perspective. Do follow us on our social media handles on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and just click on that bell icon on our YouTube channel to get reminders of videos like this one that we put up. You're watching Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Ravi.